And I'll let you guys introduce yourself. Who are you? Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. So Matt Stapleton. Um, I'm president, co-founder of CapShare. And yeah, we've been, so we make cap table management software. It feels a lot like QuickBooks or some of the other accounting software over on the financial side. But we track a lot of the nitty gritty, some of the details that Hal was talking about in that last conversation. We'll track that, make it easily accessible to you, and then help with just a lot of the compliancy type stuff around that. Um, and so we see a lot of cap tables. We're gonna focus a lot today on kind of common pitfalls that we see for fairly early stage companies. We've got, we've got about 4,500 cap tables on the system right now. Um, and so I see in any, we'll add about 200 companies a month. And so I see a lot of the really common companies getting started that are just setting up their information. I see all of the things that we're gonna talk about today. Um, we'll see at least, at least every other month I'll see um, each of these come up with a company and definitely th things that I've seen kind of kill a company out of the gates where they just set up something wrong now they're going back and having to clean that up and that can be really painful right at the time when you're trying to go through fundraising you're trying to get those other things done and this isn't what you want to focus your time on um, so that's a little bit of the overview background Jaron would you add anything on that Okay, so I've also got Jaron, our CEO here, um, that'll definitely cut me off a few times through the conversation. As we're going through this, I actually didn't bring, I brought maybe, probably 20, maybe 25 minutes worth of stuff here. So cut me off. Um, I wanna have you guys kinda cut me off, ask any of the questions that you have, happy to go into some of those details on those. So with that, let's get started. All right, so really quickly, I know we just got out of the conversation with Howard, he talked about some of this, but I wanna give you just high level, what's a cap table, what does it usually look like? So at its absolute simplest, this is a cap table. If Jaron and I were to go, each go 50-50 and buy a gas station, our gas station would have a cap table. Yeah, thanks, thanks for reminding me. So, <laughs> so this would be the gas station. Really simple, you don't need software to manage something like this. Now, this right here is an extremely standard cap table that we'll see for an early, early stage company. This is, I actually prepared this before presentation for 500 startups, this is somewhere kind of mid 500 startups, late end process for a group like that. This is really standard. I see this in kind of at least 50%-ish of the companies I talk to there. So let's break it down for a second. So first off, that first that I showed with me and Jaron, we had 50-50 percentages. If you've got a corporation, then rather than a percentage, that's gonna be expressed as a number of shares. So instead of both owning 50%, we each have a million shares for two million to total of the common shares at this stage. And Hal mentioned a little bit, you've got your common shares. You'll also have other, like the options that you'll give to your employees and the preferred shares that once you get into kind of series A, series B, you'll have preferred shares on the cap table. Basically the same as your common, but they get preferential rights that your common shareholders don't have. That's, that preferred comes from those preferential rights. So for example, I might have an investor say, here's $500,000, but if I'm giving you this money, I want my money back out before anyone else gets cash. And so that protects me so that I might be giving you 500K to own 20% of the business, if you turned around and sold the company for 500K and just gave them the cash on the books, if I wasn't preferred stock, technically I'd only get 100,000 of that. I'd get my 20% and the rest would be distributed out. That's not okay. I want, if I'm gonna give you 500K, I want that money out, then you guys can catch up to me and they'll put in special rights like that. 
but those types of privileges are what di distinguish between common stock and preferred stock. On the option side, these options, they're called derivatives. They, they don't have any value in themselves. Their value is the fact that an option is a right to buy common. And I'm guessing Hal kind of covered some of that as well. But on those options, you'll usually, you'll get this contract that says, you have the right to buy 10,000 shares for 10 cents a share. And, and we'll talk about vesting, we'll talk about some of the particulars on that. But that's how those options are set up, typically given to your employees. Occasionally you'll see options being granted to like a contractor or other things like that. But most of the time you're seeing these options go out to your employees as the way to let them participate in the upside on the company. So this all gets summed up. I get an overall cap table based on this. I think I'd, we walked in on the conversation a little bit late earlier, but it sounds like there was some conversation about an option plan or an equi equity pool kind of interchangeable terms. That's just shares that have been set aside to grant to employees in the future. So you can see on this cap table, I have these unallocated options. 12% of my cap table has been set aside to give to people later. And the reason companies will do that, because if we sold the company tomorrow for 10 million bucks here, I wouldn't just get 4.2 million, because I actually own more than that. 1.2 million of that, 12% of that, wouldn't just go to no one, because no one actually owns this plan. Um, they'd get distributed to the existing owners. So I actually own more than 42%. But this lets us do a few things. One, I don't have to see my percentage adjust every single time we issue 10,000 shares to an employee. So it gives me an idea of kind of, I can kind of predict, I intend to grant this whole pool before we exit. So I can kind of bank on that number and it gives a little bit more solidness to the numbers. The big one though is this is actually big for the investors. Because if I'm an investor, I'm getting preferred stock in the company and I give you a million dollars for 20% of this company. You're gonna take that a million dollars and you're gonna go hire three new employees and the investor doesn't want to get that 20% and then immediately start getting diluted by the employees you just hired. So often they'll require you to set up a plan so that they're not seeing that dilution the same way with each subsequent hire that you make. So just based on that, the other thing I would mention, how I was talking about convertible debt earlier, that convertible debt normally doesn't show up on your cap table until it converts. And so you'll raise money in the form of convertible notes, convertible securities like the KISS A, um, and that will, it has terms, it has rights on the cap table, but it usually doesn't show up as a number of shares because that number of shares may vary depending on the future, depending on what you raise next round um, and other, other kind of specifics on the next round, that can actually change what they end up owning. So usually you'll see the convertible debt super applicable to the cap table, but not actually showing up as a line item until it converts. So pausing on that view, just overview kind of this is a cap table. Any questions on any of that? Hi, so I've heard from uh, a lot of places that uh, founders should also be on a vesting schedule uh, as well as the employee. So how would you put that? Do, do the founder common shares go to the options or like how would that work? Great, great question. And first, and we'll, we'll camp a little bit on that founder should vest thing, but yes, I definitely agree with that. What you'll see, no, they typically still hold common stock. So they're not gonna move over to, into the options or anything. The cap table itself isn't actually gonna look any different. So let's say I might have this million shares here and on the cap table, I'm still gonna show a million shares, 
my ownership is still going to show up as 42%. But technically, if I were to leave, the company can buy back those shares for some preset ridiculously low amount. And you'll see in something, and let's, let's actually jump. Here we go. So this is just a quick screenshot out of our software. But if I were to click on those million shares and dive down, you'll often see something kind of like this. So this is that actual vesting schedule that's going on on those shares. And what this is showing, October 1st, 2013, this individual got 10,000 shares. Options are common, it acts about the same. So you've got that granted. Initially, they're unvested shares. As the vesting occurs, those move from unvested to vested. So you can see on this one, we've got a one-year cliff, kind of that standard that I think has been mentioned already. One-year cliff, 25% of those come one year later, October 1st, 2014. You then have monthly amounts being added on so that as of today, this individual has 3,750 shares vested that they own now as a, as a founder and that no matter what they do, if they could leave or anything, they keep those shares. And then the 6,250 are still subject to vesting. But on the cap table itself, doesn't affect the numbers. They'll still show their whole amount. They're just a portion of that amount they could lose if they end up leaving or situations like that. Sorry, what was that? That's right. That's right. So the difference between common stock and options, common stock, the company has a right to buy back. Options, the employee gains the right to buy those shares. Right. And I would add, <laughs> thanks. I would add it's functionally essentially equivalent. Economically, it's equivalent. You know, I mean, yes, you're, as a founder, you're granted all those shares up front, but you don't really have a right to all those shares unless you stick around. And as an employee who's granted options, that is also economically true. You know, you're granted a big option grant, but you don't get the economic rights to those unless you stick around. Does that make sense? You also mentioned something else I just want to touch on briefly. Um, a lot of folks talk about founder stock and common stock, and they get kind of confused between the two or wonder if there's a certain class of securities called founder stock. Um, founder stock is typically common stock, so that, that, is, that is the typical stock that founder, founders grant to, to each other or to themselves. And so um, what you're really talking about when we're talking about vested founder stock is actually just restricted common stock. So common stock that can be repurchased over time by the company and that the company loses its repurchase right over time. So over time you gain more and more stock that cannot be bought back by the company. Yeah, and I think I just wanted to add, like a lot of founders, first time founders always ask me, well, why am I vesting? Well, this is my baby, like I did all this work, like I should just get what it is. But once again, like investors, a lot of times early stage, we're making the bet on you. The business may change many times over the course of life, but we're betting on you and that you and your teammates are the ones that are gonna push it through. We need some assurance that you're gonna stay and do that because the reality is when one founder leaves or all founders leave, company is pretty much done. I rarely see founders leave and companies come back. So if you were given it from day one, you know, there's not a ton of incentive. You may look down and they'd be like, oh, I just had a hard week, eh, F it, I'm out. I still have my stock. I, I, that's like extreme case, but like we're trying to manage risk. Early stage investing is very, very high risk. So we want you on the same page as everyone else. And then sorry I stepped out. Did you already talk about why, why don't founders get preferred? Like they're, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we talked a you little talk, bit okay, about sorry. the kind of real cash elements of kind of the preferred and those rights that they're getting okay, cool. to protect that. To, to Sean's comment. Sean, that was an awesome comment. Um, it, it was, it, that's also a, a very important, Sean brings up both a founder and an investor mindset. That, there's a founder mindset to the vested stock question as well. I don't know if you want to talk about that, but how many times have you seen a founder leave a company and the other founder has to stick around? And if you, so we're, we're going to talk about this a bit later, but one of the big pitfalls you'll often see, I'll, I'll jump the gun a teeny bit, is 
say you have a, a co-founder team, so you're not the sole founder. If that's the case, um, we have frequently seen at CapShare in our 4,500 plus cap tables and growing, we've often seen situations where a founding team won't be the team that is left at the company by the time the company ultimately sells. So when Sean's question was, you know, a lot of times founders will ask the question, why on earth would I want to vest myself? And the answer can actually be, it might be in your best interest to vest yourself and your other co-founders all as a group, because if one of your co-founders leaves early, then they, they won't have all the shares and you won't be stuck in a situation that we've seen over and over again where if you don't do it that way, often you are left with, call it, let's say you had four co-founders, three of them leave, you're left with 25% of the company, you become Uber, you make a ton of money, they did nothing and you worked and you, you, know, you worked two jobs and stayed up you know, till 2 a.m. for five years to get your company to a successful outcome and they got all the exact same amount of rewards that you did. That's a very, um, it's, it's personally very frustrating to the entrepreneurs that go through that experience and leads to a lot of conflict, frankly. And secondly, a lot of times investors just will have, have nothing to do with that. They'll force you to get that cleaned up before they'll invest because they don't want um, that, that big of a misaligned incentives around the equity structure of the business. Yeah, founder breakups are tough. Breaking up's hard to do, but um, you're right. People want that clean, and, and like if you're going through active lawsuits with your founding team, that's going to hurt you on fundraising. And like ethically, you have to disclose that. So that's why it's like wrap this stuff up. But I, I think as I mentioned, the point of it, it gives us some security and some feeling like this is fair. You know, let's say a founder he or she works on it six months, they get nothing. That that's probably fair. If they did a year, but the business took five years to mature, okay, they do get their twenty five percent. So they're getting an allocation. They're not getting the full allocation. So I think it, it's helping us manage risk and retaining you as founders. And then I believe it's fair for the founders as a whole, you know, based on contribution of time. Yep. Um, you spoke about founders leaving. What if the company gets acquired? What happens to your shares if you're, let's say, two years into your vesting cycle and you have a remainder of three years to go if it's a five-year vesting cycle? Great, great question. So you can set up some acceleration triggers that occur in the event of a change of ownership, basically an acquisition. So you can basically say, okay, we're the founders, yeah, we're vesting, we wanna keep everyone around the table, we want those benefits, but I'm not gonna sit and wait for my money if the company sells. You'll set up, it's typically called a single trigger um, acceleration, and what that means is, if the company changes control, if someone buys over 50% of this, my shares become immediately fully vested. And that's so, that's so that you get your money out, you're not harmed in the event of that acquisition. Um, the alternative, and you'll see this often for employees and something to think about, something called a double trigger, where it's not enough for the company to be bought. Company has to be bought and the person has to be terminated for them to get the, their shares. And how, correct me if I'm wrong, basically in this situation, a chunk of your ownership, a chunk of your money in the acquisition would actually go to like an escrow account. And does it get paid off over time basically as you continue to work for the now owning entity? <laughs> we, we do get this question a bit, uh, you know, at, at Clerky, but uh, almost universal to see a double trigger. Uh, a single trigger is extremely, extremely rare. Uh, and you know, if you think about it from Sean's point of view, you're like, wait a second here, <laughs> wait, <laughs> I want the guy to stick around. <laughs> so it, it's usually you're going to see a double trigger. That's the double trigger is more makes the company more valuable because it encourages people to stick around after the acquisition. And so that's really, really common um, just because it adds that value to the company that's being bought because now as an acquirer, I can look at it and say, yeah, most of your dev team still has kind of two and a half years on their vesting. So I don't have to pay them as much 
to get them to stay around because they're incentivized to hang out and collect the rest of their cash from the exit. And so that's that single or double trigger that you can kind of set up based on your situation. Uh, other questions? Can you put a single acceleration for founders and then double for employees? Yeah, you can switch on okay. the same company. Other questions or? Okay, let's keep going a little bit. So backing up one slide. So what, what I've got basically from here, I think I've got five issues that we'll mention that these are the things that I see really mess up early stage companies. Um, so these are the, if you want to mess yourself up on the legal and cap table side, these are kind of the ways to do it. So the first one that we just hit is the vesting. Founders should vest. And I know Sean did a great job of taking kind of the investor stance on that founder vesting, but I, I've seen so many companies where they've got three founders, 33% each, one guy leaves, and man, 2 a.m. feels so much later when you've got like 33% of dead weight on your cap table. Um, and that's, that's something that I don't know that you necessarily always pick up on as an early stage company because it's like, yeah, but we're all like getting rich. Um, but man, when you're working on those, I capture we're three years old. Um, we're a startup just like a lot of you guys, raising money a lot like a lot of you guys. And those are the type of things, they start really mattering as you're dialing that in and starting to realize what this value actually means. And in our situation, we're not bad. We've got 2.8% of our cap tables dead weight. And I can live with 2.8%. Um, they earned it, they vested, they got to a point where um, they had those shares. But man, 5% would hurt. <laughs> and I don't think that there's right numbers for everyone. It's different person to person. But personal experience, that's one thing. Vest as founders and vest the rest of your team. It will save you dramatic. I, these are the type of things that can kind of crush a company. Yeah, if I can just add there, I mean, it, it feels like even from the perspective of the founder that leaves, it's almost even in his interest to ensure that, you know, he doesn't have more ownership than he kind of deserves, right? Because in a lot of ways then, you know, if you're, you have handcuffs on your co-founders that you're leaving behind in terms of, you know, being able to fundraise, being able to, you know, grant, grant additional options that are attractive to get other talented founders to help take the company higher. So even if you're, you know, you leave the company after one year and you own 33% of the company, if the pie is only that small, right, it might be, have been much more in your interest to own, you know, five, 10% of the company and, you know, hopefully the company is able to use that stock to, to grow much bigger, so you're still gonna get more money out of it. So like it, it yeah. seems to make sense on yeah, all accounts. I think, that's a great, I think that's a great point. I mean, a lot of what you're hearing is there are certain rules and standards and practices that have emerged over time around, you know, around vesting and triggers and all these things, and they're there not only to protect you, they're there not only to protect investors, they're there to protect you, and I love your point, you know, I mean, a lot of times, again, to, to your point, I mean, even the leaving, the person, the founder leaving the team, you know, sometimes if they, let's say you had 50% dead weight on your cap table, I mean, there's there's no way an investor is going to let that stand when they invest money into your company. So you're, you're almost uninvestable often if you've messed up your cap table really badly. And so that when I say uninvestable, there are lots of ways to fix that problem. <laughs> but uh, basically some kind of hard form of a solution will be presented to you that you that will have to fix your cap table if you've kind of gotten it that messed up. So, yeah. yeah. And it's funny because we meet with a lot of early stage companies that are going through this. And it's amazing how often there's almost a social dynamic of like, they're like, yeah, but we're the best friends ever type of thing. And I know people People chuckle at that and say, yeah, that's dumb. People do it all the time with pretty legit companies. And I mean, I get it. Both our wives make fun of us as having second spouses um, with our relationship, but it's not uncommon. 
things happen in these situations, it really does protect both of you. Um, so moving on from that, any other questions on the vesting thing? I think we've hashed it fairly hard. I was just gonna ask, uh, when you have a, a single founder, do you want, is there anything you wanna say is, should be done differently or, um, or somebody who's yet to find a co-founder or they're you know, starting off? Uh, good question. Um, those tend to behave differently on this. I think Sean might have more of an opinion and might encourage the vesting stronger from a investor standpoint. Um, but it depends. What I've seen historically is usually when you've got a single founder, the amount of founder vesting that I see going on does decrease pretty dramatically. That's probably more a conversation between founder and investors than like founder and co-founder. Um, so investors can do things uh, retroactively as well. I mean, they, they can come into a new round and say, now that we just invested in you and you're the sole founder, we want you to have, we want to, you to impose some investing on yourself. So things can be somewhat fixed after the fact. It's not like you're in a complete and total disaster situation. If you've, if you've chosen not to invest yourself, you're a sole founder and an investor wants to invest in you. I don't, I don't think that would be anywhere near a deal uh, break, breaking situation at all. Usually, like Matt said, usually it's in group founder situations that you'll see founders really want to actually insist on investing to protect themselves against the possibility that one leaves. And certainly doing so will make you look smart in front of investors and should make that whole fundraising process a lot easier. All right, let's go to the next one. So non-papered promises. Um, I see these, I used to say I see these on at least half. I see these on at least four-fifths of the early stage companies that we talk to, which means most people in this room will make this mistake. So right here, this is a conversation that I'll have at least, eh, probably not once a week, but close to it. We're a CEO, we're going through, we're setting up their cap table, we've got all, everything kind of tied out, and then they'll be like, oh yeah, yeah, there was that, we promised John 3% to get us these three large contracts, and he got one of them, but then he got another offer and he ended up taking off, and that's not reflected in anything. And so they've got other agreements that they've created that are based on share amounts, um, but those share amounts are now slightly different because you've got this guy with a percentage that you set up 12 months ago, two rounds ago, and now you're asking the question, does he get 1% of what was outstanding then? Does he get 1% of what's outstanding now? Um, get things figured out. This is, a, this is a big one that, no, this is less killer. I don't see keep companies completely dying on this, but you've got to get these types of things worked out. These things will cost you dramatically, and these create a lot of the um, kind of news line, headline cap table issues where you've got unpapered promises to co-founders that, you know, giving the example of Facebook, you've got the social network movie is about this type of stuff, and other situations, these are, get these types of things papered up. Um, I see a lot of startups that are avoiding the legal fees and go on and on and on avoiding. And that's great. You're trying to conserve money. You're an early stage startup and you're trying to make that, you know, X 100,000, 50,000 or whatever, stretch as long as you can. If you're going to end up being successful, which is your goal, this will cost you. So it's one of those situations where it's like, yeah, I get the wanting to save money, um, but all you're doing is you're making success dramatically more painful. This is one of the things that's worth, and it's been mentioned before, you don't need to run up drastic legal fees on something like this. It doesn't have to be crazy expensive. There's a lot of really great options to get stuff like this put in place on the cheap, um, but it is worth doing. Yeah. 
good options, right? So do you recommend mm -hmm. any type of like SaaS solutions for cap tables that in order that want to enable transparency amongst the co-founders and say your legal counsel? So ours, I mean, there's, a, <laughs> there's a number of good, we've got some great competitors. <laughs> there it is, all right, where's, where's the promo code? That's, I mean, CapShare software is built to make transparency, you can share everything out, you can make it available to everyone. Um, Great question. And then on the legal side as well, I, there's a number of products like Clerky that will help with some of these um, fees. There's, there are the online contracts, kind of the freely available things. I know Auric has some really good startup, their startup library where they've got a, got a lot of good forms. Um, be <laughs> Yeah, you need to, so a few things, you need to get something signed between you, really understanding the details of what you're agreeing to. On that understanding the de details, there's some terms around what was the date on this. The biggest though that I see is get out of percentages as quick as you can. Um, What's often happening, as I mentioned, a C corporation is expressed as a number of shares. Um, and so what happens is you'll express a percentage with someone because you're negotiating and it's easier and it means more, frankly, than some random arbitrary share count. But get to the shares fast, get that agreed on and sign. That will go a long ways because then you don't have these kind of, well, is that 1.5% of then or now? Um, it will solidify the numbers for when you're trying to do things in the future you're working with a real thing. That's the biggest thing I see. Um, and then getting that papered up, there are those libraries, there's those people that, you know, like the Oryx startup forms that'll help you fill in kind of all of the blanks on these. Those are good. Um, but I guess my caution there would be be careful. We used some free forms on our first convertible debt round. It's costing us because there was some bad language in those forms. And it's not dramatic. It's not a deal killer. Um, but I'm paying like eight, I think it's like 6K in taxes that I wouldn't otherwise. Um, which, yeah, I can live with 6K. Um, but I'm not rich. I'm not making, you know, material wealth in any form. And so that, that means a lot. It's better than nothing. I mean, there is a spectrum. There's a spectrum is kind of my response here. And boy, it's better than nothing. There's should be something legitimate around, especially if it's like an option grant. There's usually a notice of option grant um, document that'll go through and it'll specify things like the vesting and it's not hard to get that set up. I mean, again, shameless plug here, but I mean, I think that this is a direct question there and I don't need to just plug our system there there I mean we automate option grants I mean that's a big part of what we do so in a lot of companies come to us precisely for that reason they want to have an electronic representation of something that is typically done in a paper process and um, so so and it, it's very inexpensive because you can set up an automated template grant and then you can issue it to as many people as you want and you can do that in concert with your your law firm or your lawyer we have lots of law firms and a lot of lawyers that work on CapShare and our competitors do as well so to answer your question I mean I, I actually would kind of say what, what we're specifically talking to about non-papered promises certainly goes beyond option grants but that is a big area where we often see it. In fact, that's probably the most frequent area is you'll, have, you'll bring on a consultant. They'll often have what's called milestone-based vesting. We haven't touched on that, but there are kind of two main types of vesting. There's time-based vesting, which just occurs naturally over time as you stick around at a company. There's another form of vesting called milestone-based vesting, which is hey, I brought you on as a consultant to help us generate our first 100,000 in sales. If you generate 100,000 in sales, we'll give you 50,000 shares. If you generate 200,000, we'll give you 100,000 shares, et cetera, et cetera. 
those can all be automated and papered. So papered might not be the right word because we actually eliminate paper and put it into an electronic medium, but they can be electronically signed and both parties can have a copy permanently and they can be backed up on Amazon S3, which our system is. And so, you, you know, a lot of these issues just kind of go away. And um, I hope that kind of answered, I hope that helped answer your question. Any others on that? Cool. All right, the next one, competing equity records, we see a lot. And so often your law firm will have one record of who owns what, um, usually founders, and if you've got, often I'll see a couple members of the management team with kind of their own records of everything. And eventually as you grow, you'll get into You'll have a valuation firm with some record. You might have an accounting firm, outsource CFO with some record. Um, it's really common to see these disagree. And so this again, I'm gonna go straight for the shameless plug here, but find a platform where everyone can work on the same data so that you don't have these issues. Because that can be, I was speaking to the senior attorney at a public company who said this has killed acquisitions for them because they go to acquire a company, there's different versions of the equity information and they don't want to deal with the liability that's going to come with, there's going to be payouts that come with this acquisition and they're not okay with that liability and so they walked from the deal. And so that's that can be even more dramatic than running into issues on a potential fundraise because someone lost out on what would have been a pretty awesome acquisition. Can I, can I speak one thing on this? I mean, often, I would say on this one particularly, I mean, often it's not the, the end of the world situation, but, but uh, you know, your, your companies often are doing things out in advance of their law firm. And so, you know, they'll, they'll hire someone and they won't get around to telling the law firm about that until, you know, several days or months later. Um, <clears throat> sometimes they will have someone leave or go on maternity or paternity leave and their vesting will be altered, but they won't communicate that back to the law firm. That's the problem that electronic cap table solutions are trying to help solve. Those are, that's one of the big problems is to kind of keep everything updated real time, tie it in with your HR records, et cetera, so that at any given time, there's the people who have a right to that equity information or who need to consume it, like your law firm, your investors, or you as founders, or frankly, even the, the folks that you've granted equity to can get onto an accurate system that's up to date at any given time. Awesome, all right, let's go. Okay, I think this is actually, is that, yeah. So, yeah, I think a lot, a lot of this has been touched on already. So this is my kind of compliance page where there are a number of things that you don't necessarily need to understand perfectly what's going on here. I do want to touch on all of these because as founders, I think what's valuable here is um, know what you don't know and know when you need to go look these things up. I think that's kind of the valuable. If you know when to go track these down, that will go a long ways. So first one sounds like it's been covered in detail, 83B elections. Um, any additional questions on that one? Okay, next one, ISO 100K limit. So there's two different kinds of options that you can give people. Incentive stock options or ISOs or non-qualified stock options or NSOs or NQALs. Um, so ISO has tax advantages over NSO. And not gonna go into a ton of detail there, the trick with an ISO is you can't give an employee more than $100,000 worth of ISO options that become exercisable in a given calendar year. And I use that language very specifically. Basically what that means is, let's say I give someone an ISO worth 200K. If it vests immediately, 
that's not okay. It can't be an ISO. You have to treat part of it as a non-qualified stock option. There's some tax implications to that. Um, if it vested over four years, I'd be fine because at 50K a year of that 200K, I'm below the 100K. Couple things to think about here though. There's something, you can make your options early exercisable, meaning they can actually exercise them before they vest and then they go into that whole restricted stock that can be repurchased by the company. If it's early exercisable, the whole thing is exercisable as soon as it's granted. And so you could run into this problem. The other thing is this is per individual, not per grant. So I could give someone one grant, two years later give them another grant, and run up into this when you get kind of the aggregate between the two. Yeah. It's, so it's with a USC corporation. Um, ISOs have tax advantages that the NSO doesn't. Basically, um, with an ISO, if you exercise it, um, you don't have to pay taxes right then. With an NSO, you do. So let's say you get an NSO for a dollar a share. Value goes up to $5 a share and then you exercise it. You pay a dollar to buy the stock and then you have to pay four taxes on $4 worth of compensation per share for an NSO. For an ISO, that compensation waits until you actually sell the shares, which is when you have the money to pay the tax. Any questions on that one? Here, I loved how Matt started this out. These are really technical details for a lot of founders, and probably, you know, you, you're going to be more focused on building your business, hopefully, right? I mean, this is great for you to know, it's good information, but you can get weighed down in these compliance details. The, the bigger point I like that Matt highlighted right out of the shoots here is kind of know what you don't know and know when you're treading on some, some compliance stuff that you might need to go get some outside. These are areas that kind of fit into that category. These are great conversations to, you know, bring up with your law firm. Your law firm will probably keep you educated that if you're using an online platform like CapShare, we're going to notify you if you ever if you ever run afoul of any of these types of situations. There will be automated notif notifications that go out to you, so you can address that at the time. The bigger issue here, as founders and as as, as entrepreneurs is to just know there are some compliance issues around equity grants that you should generally be aware of so you can avoid some, you know, some problems down the road and you can know where to get outside help. Yeah. Yeah. And so just wrapping up the last three really quick, rule 701, you technically, if you stay below a few thresholds um, when granting your stock, you don't have to tell the government that you're granted that stock. Once you get over those thresholds, you do. And the bit, the nice one that as long as, as long as you're granting less than a million dollars worth of stock per year, you'll always be fine on this rule 701. Once you get above that, you may be fine, you may not take a look, is kind of the, the quick story on that one. Um, stock option expensing. Until you have audited financials, this doesn't matter. Once you have audited financials, there's an expense you have to book on your profit and loss statement that has to do with your cap table. You'll want to look into called ASC 718 or stock option expensing. The last one here, and this is pretty big, pretty early on, 409A. When you grant options, you're required to grant them at the money meaning at the value of your common stock today. And the reason this exists, back in like the old... You're not required to, but there are tax penalties if you don't. And the tax penalties can be pretty, pretty bad. It's basically ordinary income on the difference, on the spread, plus a 20% fee penalty. Um, so yeah, it can get... Good question. It, can, I, can I actually address that one? Is that okay? So, and we're, we're actually, this, this week, by the end of this week, we're actually putting a free 409A calculator online. So, 
Um, so check that out. It's a great question because um, it, 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 it's a, and it's a kind of a sophisticated question. You, whenever you grant stock options, Sean and everyone, you actually have to specify a strike price on those stock options. Technically, you need to have some form of validation for why you chose the stock, the strike price that you chose. In other words, it can't just be a, hey, you know, I thought we were worth two cents a share. I put two cents a share on there. You know, the government doesn't like that. And if the IRS ever got involved, which they have not, they've never ever, to my knowledge, gone after any early stage company for a violation of 409A. Most people believe that this regulation was implemented to protect against companies that are much more obviously valuable than the earliest stage startups. That said, most people do not want to mess with, you know, the old phrase about like death and taxes. You know, I mean, those are kind of the two worst things that can happen. And so most people want to be very careful. So what we, what we typically see is if you have not raised, if you only have common stock and you have no preferred, you have not raised a, a lot of money and certainly have raised no institutional capital. Um, uh, you may have a, some convertibles or maybe some founders have put in some cash. Then you can either perf you can perform your own 409A evaluation. You can go online and use a calculator or you can talk to a uh, financially savvy person like a director on your board, one of your angel investors, or um, give us a call and we can make some referrals. There are folks who can do this in a very, very inexpensive way, i.e. potentially even free for those early, early stage, like brand new startups. For any companies that have raised an institutional round, we typically recommend that you get an actual 409A, that you actually have a firm provide that 409A. And most companies that have raised an institutional round of funding will want to do that because the risk reward starts to really shift for hey, you know, like we offer a $99 a month 409A package. And once you've raised, you know, an institutional round, even a small series A, the risk reward of, hey, if the IRS did come after me and they did want to see a more document, some documented evidence of a valuation, starts to look a lot more attractive when you're talking about saving $1,200 a year um, at a stage where you've raised a, a, you know, a, a lot of money versus when you're a brand new startup and $1,200 might be the difference between you eating, you know, dinner <laughs> that night or whatever, you know? And so that's, that's typically what we, what we see, Sean. I don't know if that answered your question, but bright line around the time you raise an institutional round. Good question, and that's that's one of those things that like, one of the advantages of having someone do this is they're good at getting that value lower, which is good for your, in, yeah, you get a lower strike price, it makes those options more valuable. The reason you can get away from, with it, and the reason that a valuation firm would be able to justify that, is things like the preferences we were mentioning before. Because the preferred shareholders, the investors, have rights that the common doesn't have, we can kind of spread that gap between what they paid and what the common stocks were. I thought just Silicon Valley investors are dumb and they pay a massive premium, so there's, there's that too. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so I don't want to run too long because we have lunch and I can, my tummy's grumbling. I can hear some grumblings out here. Um, I'd like to kind of, how much more is on the deck? To go through? Uh, no, I think we had kind of a pitch page after this. But. Okay. Can we go through the rest, and then if you have a few more questions, and then are you guys available to hang out for a bit? Yeah. And so I would say if you have a very specific cap table question, if you want to show them your cap table, um, grab them and, and just get some time outside, and they can go through that individually. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. That's, I was just going to, my last one, just so that you guys kind of get a sense here, cap share is free for companies with less than 20 shareholders. So for like everyone in this room, and software's free. There's some advanced stuff where you can like project out a new round and we, our typical pricing is $2 per shareholder per month. So for an early companies like you, really doesn't add up to that much. The other mention there, we mentioned the 409A, Jaron mentioned 99 bucks a month will cover that 409A. A few other things that we do like the stock option expensing I mentioned, but it kind of just doesn't apply to you guys. But yeah, let us know where we can be useful for most of you guys, it's not going to be an expensive thing. And yeah, I think that's kind of great. 
Uh, and like, just to be fair, like we use you guys because we like you. You're easy to work with. Like, who else is out there? There's eShares. Is yeah, there a so third? Like, eShares is a big one. Okay. The others, I mean, there's a couple that okay. we just don't really ever actually see. ShareWave, though. ShareWave. Okay. But, but the other big one is a cut. There's a bunch on the public side that have kind of private offerings, but they're built for public companies, so they're okay. kind of heavy. Yeah, big. expensive. It sounds like. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> it's okay. We're recording this. We just tweeted that out, but yeah, it's okay. But, but I will say that, you know, like Solium, they have a one called Cap MX, which is now three branch shareboards. I actually think they're kind of the 800 pound gorilla. Although the 8,000 pound gorilla in our space is six out, you know, so I would actually mention that to you. I mean, we certainly, we actually put up online a free Excel cap table template. So, you know, that we, we want to help you at whatever stage you're at. We totally get it if you're just kind of like, hey, we, we do not want to pay money right now. We, we understand that. We'll, we're still helpful friendly people. You can chat in and we'll help you answer questions as best we can, even about your Excel and have people come if you want. That's how we build trust. And down the road, when you're a million, two million, three million, million dollar company, you're going to come to us because we've built trust with you. And that's true for all of our competitors as well. So, you know, go yep. ahead and chat in. Yeah, we, we mostly see Excel, but that, that's where you have this yeah. challenge where all of a sudden you have two docs and then you gotta start doing timeline. Okay, wait, when was this created? What where are the events? And, and this is when the legal costs go up and, and fights happen. People yell. Uh, all right, let's we want to do yep, go ahead. Sorry, very quickly. Um, this presentation that you just showed us, will this be available or emailed to us after? Yeah, I think for simplicity and to reduce emails, let's do everything together. Okay. And so unless that email becomes too big, but we'll, we'll sit every deck uh, and any other information, you know, in one single email. Perfect. Yep. Thanks. Yep. Other questions? Go. Um, so, uh, you to your strike price. And so why do you need to do that on a monthly basis? For 12, I'm sorry, you're covered for 12 months, typically. The, the, the regulation is that you need to establish a strike price once every year, and then you're covered with some key exceptions. If there's a, what, a significant value-changing event in your company, you may actually need to get it more often than a year. And so that's why we do monthly. The pricing is work, works out to roughly $1,200 a year, and you're fine to pay up front if you prefer to do that, but the idea is that we actually kind of ensure that we'll keep your valuation updated should you, in, in, should you have a value changing event. And we'll actually look for those proactively by managing your cap table. So we'll see if there is a value changing event and we'll notify you. And so that helps you to stay compliant with 409A. If that, if that, that, it's more of a pricing strategy for us because you're a startup. Most, a lot of startups like to just pay in smaller month, <laughs> monthly increments. But to yeah. be frank, it, it doesn't matter if you want to pay us all up front or if you want to pay us $99. We are going to contractually obligate you to, to pay us at least a year's worth so that we can recoup the cost. <laughs> so, and that's, that's typically Can we works. clarify valuation event? That, that doesn't yes. mean grandma said this is good and it's right. worth something. It, it, yes. it means like a new round. An equity round took yes. place. Like and for an most, evaluation was set by an investor. Yes. Okay. For most of you, it's going to mean a new round. But... It could actually mean so it could be something different, and it's, yeah. it's important to probably spell out what that could be. But that uh, also specifically an equity round, not necessarily a note, or could a note drive a, a trigger? A note could drive okay, it. Okay, because there and is a valuation Any, any cap. significant yeah. valuation indicating event, which could also be, let's say you got a term sheet to be acquired by a public company, or okay. you... And, and, even and if then you don't you, execute it. And, and it wasn't executed, but then okay. you said no. Unfortunately, you know, if it was like $300 million term sheet, you kind of... Those c could be construed, especially if there's evidence, right, of this happening. Those yeah. could very much be construed as, hey, you're not worth the two million dollars that you were last year. You're now worth a hundred million dollars, yeah, right? Probably should sign that and, if that yeah, happens. Yeah. Right, right. You probably should probably exit at that point. But um, another one, just really quickly, Sean, is if you're a brand new kind of garage startup, and then you have no revenues, you get a 409A, or you use a calculator or something because you're like, hey, we're nothing. We're two people in a garage and whatever, and then you start to get revenues, that would also be like a value changing event because now you're getting, you're actually showing some traction. So it's kind of a significant change and there's really only those three, kind of a liquidity event, a fundraising event, or a major business milestone that has been achieved. So we're gonna be in one of those three categories. 
Just an add-on question there, actually. From an investor perspective, do you need to worry about the strike price setting a precedent around valuation? So, you know, if I want to issue some options, and obviously I want to have the low, low strike price to make sure that those shares are as valuable as possible, but then I go to raise, you know, raise around, are investors going to look and say, oh, well, you just valued your company, you know, three months ago when you issued these shares at this, so, so that's a valuation, right? Yeah, but is like that the, a the danger? No, the 409 is like super conservative and the investor is paying yeah. massive premiums. They're, they're, yeah, they're yeah. pricing it based on, on the future, whereas right. 409 is pricing it more realistically right, on right. today. And so, no, I think the, the investor will always pay much more. Right. Uh, and then typically what I'm seeing too, the 409 happens after the investment. Right. So the investment's made and then you run the process. So the investment's already done and then the 409 is sort of like they were talking about, just to be compliant because yeah. there's been a change in and valuation. Like Investors generally get that, like, this is a tax thing. The goal is to get it low right. Yeah. Um, right. Right. for less yeah. taxes. So, so it's pretty common to see I go raise around at a $10 million valuation, and then I can actually, for whatever reasons, when I'm doing the 409, you know, issue at a strike price of a $5 million valuation. Can you actually yeah. issue at a lower strike price and, than and, your value? And, and I would raise? maybe, I would say the effective answer is yes, but I, whenever you're dealing with, like, compliance stuff, right. um, that's kind of what a great uh, valuation service will do for you because technically you don't want, you know, again, you don't want like bad fact patterns when you're dealing with the IRS. And so, and, and you want to be compliant. And so, no, I would say, actually, if you just raise money at a $10 million round, you want to find a 409A firm that will take that into account and actually put that in their report and have it bear on their report, but still find compliant ways and, and uh, safe ways for both you and them with regards to the IRS to get your common share price value down as low as can be defended. And that's really important. You, j you want it to be defensible, okay? Because no one wants a situation. In fact, in, I, I would actually say even your investors don't want you to be granting stock at an undefensibly low price. That's bad for everyone. So does that make sense? And I yeah. completely agree with Sean though. Like, most, I mean, it's almost laughable. A lot of investors will just be like, they, they don't even care what your 409A valuation says in terms of how they think about your own valuation. But they do want to see that you're getting them done because they want you to be compliant. So, yep. yeah. Yeah, also it's harder for them to value these companies. Like, what if you're really cutting edge? You're like, you know, the freaking drone-based VR application on the blockchain, and it's like, that, that's hard to put value on. <laughs> investors will be like, yeah, 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 those are all the buzzwords I like. Boom, pay a lot. But the, the 409, not so much. But. Yeah, I know, right? It probably exists. Yeah. Um, this might sound really basic, but who has who has the right to see your cap table, and how how early should you show investors, um, service providers, uh, potential employees? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I'll sort of start with that. Like, like service providers know. Um, employees depends, and, and you know, C level maybe you want to include them. Lower level, I don't know if they're going to really understand what this means. Um, people you're bringing on as potential later co-founders should have full access and be able to look at it as well. Um, vendors, I can't think of a reason why a vendor would, other than like a, a debt, a venture debt vendor, yeah. like like bank, someone who's maybe sometimes you're, you're yeah, like yeah. a banker or a lender. Um, but I, I think that like employees should be able to ask you how many, like because you're going to say I'm giving you 10,000 shares, let's say. Like they should be able to go to you and say, well, how many are outstanding? Like they should be able to ask you these questions to figure out percentages and determine that. You don't want to hide this type of stuff from them. Um, but yeah, I kind of love your answer. Like, I, I don't know, like this is where I, I, I go on founder side where I'm like, yeah, let's just be transparent. Let's, we all love each other. Let's get it in the open. But then there's probably other issues to think about. This is kind of a hot topic in our space, which you know is kind of a, a, an interesting but cool entrepreneurial space. It's kind of a hot topic around cap what we, we call it cap table transparency. And um, we actually posted up a blog article on it, which I can share with you later on if you're interested. But I, I actually, I agree wholeheartedly with what, what Sean said. There are some interesting um, nuances around decisions that you might want to make. There are some, I think Buffley actually, or, or Buffer actually, I think post, like they just, they went like yeah, crazy transparent. They're scary transparent. Yeah, they they like post I, salaries. And, yeah, yeah, and I think it's, I honestly personally would, I, we have certainly have not chosen that level of transparency, yeah. even at CapShare, like not even close. So, um, but th there are some choices that you can make here, and most of the, our competitors and we offer solutions around granting transparency at whatever level you want to. 
I think let's let's talk really quick on uh, investors that may ask for that. And so I, I think that this is also tough, but like if you really like them, you're really close, and they just want to check to confirm, then yes, let them see it. Don't don't hide. Um, what they're looking for is like mainly they're looking for you as the founder. How much equity do you have? Are you long term vested? Are you oh do you only have a single digit? Because that means you're probably not going to go the long run. You know, they want to make sure you have good equity. They want to make sure there's no kind of weird stuff going on, too. What I'd be concerned about is, like, small angel. It's like, yeah, like, random person from AngelList. They're like, yeah, I'm going to give you five grand. For five grand, they barely have the right to email you, like, let alone to get, like, all this stuff. Just being honest. But once again, like, really, really good firm, like, like Intel Capital or, like, like, a real fund is, like, they want to see it. It's like, yeah, give it to them. They, they have the right to, and, and they can make a big impact, and, and they're going to be with you long term. So I'd be sort of careful about the angels, but then anyone that you really want a good relationship or they're a really good fund, I would you know, give it to them. They're gonna have access to and it. And make sure to mark it confidential, always. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but I mean, that, I mean, that sort of helps, but like, they, they won't share it so much. It's, it's mostly like I'm looking for like, did the founders get screwed? Because I really want to make sure they're long-term vested here. And I want to make sure there's not you know, s some scary, weird you know, oil money or something like hiding in there, some weird fund or something like that. I, I, I like that, you know, maybe when we go raise money, we should have thresholds where like, if you give me more than $5,000, I'll let you, <laughs> it, I'll let you like, email me twice, you know? It is, no, you, and it's like, it's as you like put more money in, it's like, campaign. It, it yeah. like, you know, like the fogginess kind of like dissipates yeah, and you can see it. Exactly. Yeah, there you go. This, <laughs> the slider. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, all right, well, if there's more questions I want to take them, but I'm also hungry too. Is anyone else, more questions? All right, so these guys will hang out. If you have questions, definitely grab them. Um, as I mentioned, being super candid, I raised a bunch of money. I didn't know how cap tables work. It bit me in the butt a little bit. Like, I do not want this to happen to you. Um, I would say that if you grab them while they're here, just take them outside so we can keep going with the session um, or talk to them at lunch. But uh, thank you. Very helpful. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys.